Assalamu alaikum. This is Mind Heist with Achi Tweet and Amin, who just spent, well, how long is it? 32 minutes trying to get uh, their call working. I know. You've been blocked off because you're a security threat. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Wow, I didn't realize it had been 30 minutes, but subhanAllah. Hopefully, Skype will work See? next time. Th- these guys could have had an hour and 30 minute episode today. But no, yeah. they're not. They're not getting yeah. it. Yalla, <laughs> inshallah. Okay, so so you told me, uh, bro, that um, last episode got good feedback. Yeah. What was the feedback? Feedback was, uh, it was. I think a lot of it was based on like certain points that we made, because okay. we got very um, very good feedback on like, I suppose, especially the ihsan point about having baraka in your your money mm. and doing doing the best you can and abiding by your contracts and that kind of stuff um great i guess people don't really think of that or that perspective isn't really looked at much so we yeah. brought it up i thought it was a good it was a good point you brought up in terms of uh okay like uh i can pray at work and i'm praying on time at work but am i working properly as i've agreed to work yeah it's a good, very good point so okay i've got some some topics for the part two of the kind of uh, money finance kind of uh, topic yeah. right so in terms of like getting a good job and uh, you know getting a good income and stuff a lot of muslims feel like you know the the odds are stacked against them firstly uh-huh. and also people in general feel like it's hard i mean how many times have i heard the market's not good yeah and the market is very good right now like since 2008 9 10 since that recession, like uh, the economy's kind of, uh, what's the word, uh, recovered from that. Like things are great right now. In fact, I'm kind of anticipating a crash soon, you know. Right. So, um, so if people say the market is bad, the market is bad. I think they always say that no matter how the things are, right? Yeah. But um, how do you, because you, you've been looking for a job recently or you were looking for a job. So how do you see it? Um, it's easy to lose hope when you're not making any progress. I think that's mm. what people struggle with because, you know, it took me. Well, let's say let's let's think about it like practically. I graduated in 2015, uh, yeah. and since May 2015, I was applying for more professional roles to do with my degree, and yeah. I didn't get anything really until October of 2017. You know, mm. so it was a long, long, well, long in my eyes anyway. Uh, journey to get to where I am and I'm not saying what I've got is incredible it's better than my little part-time thing I was doing before but it's a step in the right direction and I think you have to just Mm. manage your expectations and not rush to you know expect that you're gonna be raking it in on the first Mm. job you get with a degree really and truthfully I think we might have mentioned this before I can't remember it's all about experience isn't it it's not really about the piece of paper that you have or because um, yeah. everybody knows that everyone who's applying for jobs know that now when they're applying everybody wants experience everybody wants yeah. something that generally you don't really have unless you can cultivate it and build mm. it up what do you think so what was your method for getting a job it was like uh, for applying again well that's the thing that's how i guess pure xi sort of came out of that it was the fact that it was taking so long i thought i'd sort of start my own little thing um, mm. But as far as so you were, you had like your part time job that you had while you were in uni. Yeah, you kept that going. Yeah, uh, you, which is very good to be honest. Most people wouldn't have that. Uh, you kept that going. You did pure XI and you're applying for for more like full time jobs. Yeah, and I guess okay. uh, as far as what I was doing to apply, it's just simple stuff like just online applications and just doing as many as I could. I mean, for the particular yeah. organization I'm working with, I applied for sixty positions. <clears throat> Mm. Didn't hear from any of them apart from one. But I tell you what, the mm. the position I did get in the end, I didn't get out of my like on my own. Um, yeah. Someone in the organisation could see that I was applying so much, and right. and and emailed me saying, "Oh, do you want some help in in applying, or do you want some coaching, oh, or whatever?" Yeah. And it yeah. was because really they didn't have that many. Um, what's the word? Ethnically diverse Candidates? people. Oh right. Okay. <laughs> so I. I sort of use that to my advantage, like, oh yeah, I'm a Muslim and I'm, I'm foreign looking. Yeah, get me on board, kind of thing. And I just took, oh really? Yeah. Okay. So it is a bit of like using what, play you, the game. yeah, play the game and use who can help you. If you know people, then take advantage of it. Yeah. You know. Yeah, 
I mean, people are biased towards people that they've even met just once. Yeah. That will, that's enough sometimes to put you ahead because people are just more comfortable with people they know and they kind of know what to expect from them a little bit at least is way better than someone, a stranger online with an email address and a yeah. you know, PDF CV. No you know? doubt. So, or even worse, a, a Word document CV. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, last time uh, I was applying for a job, it was probably October of, uh, 2016 yeah, yeah. Uh, that I was applying for a job uh, over uh, then and uh, I think I was applying for for jobs probably I was taking it seriously for maybe three months yeah and what I did was okay firstly I spent quite a lot of time getting a good CV and there are two ways I did that so firstly I got experience in the in in a field um by just jumping into it. Right. So I was applying for marketing roles and I just helped people wherever I could with their marketing, yeah. which means I had real experience to put on my CV and it had real stuff to um, talk about in interviews in terms of real results that, that I've done. Even if it was small campaigns that I'd run, yeah. um, I had something to talk about. Also, I kept up to date on in like marketing in general and that pro that's probably because I'm quite interested in it. Uh, but that also gave me a lot to talk about in interviews, right? And then the second thing I did was I made my CV as good as possible, meaning I, I put myself in the position of the employer and I thought, what, how can I structure this CV to make it someone make it so someone scanning this is going to the things they're looking for is going to jump out at them, yeah. you know? So, for example, I'm applying for a marketing role right at the top. I'm not going to put my education, even though my education is good, but I'm not going to put it there. I'm going to put, like, I can't remember how my CV is, but it's, I think it's got uh, skills gained through experience, something like that. That was the first thing. Then I had bullet points, and the first thing in the bullet point was bolded, and it was the skill that they might want. Right. right? So, for example, just making it up. So, for example, uh, managing uh, advertising campaigns. Right. That would be bold. And then after that, in normal writing, I would put what I did in my experience uh, in managing those campaigns. Right. Right? So I did a few bullet points like that. So that jumps right at them. Then afterwards, you've got my like, education and this and that. Um, so I did that. Then I just saw it completely as a numbers game. So I thought, look, I don't care where I'm applying. I'm not going to focus on applying to specific places. I'm just going to apply for three jobs every day, non-stop, right? Yeah. I just saw it as a numbers game. And uh, I, I tried different channels. So I tried some websites, you know, where you get loads of jobs posted, like uh, Indeed or whatever. But then I also tried LinkedIn. Right, yeah. Uh, you can apply directly th for jobs in LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, actually, I think it makes you look better than your CV. Yeah, right. definitely. So, um, so I actually got, the, got the, a job through LinkedIn. Uh, that's how I got it. Um, and through using this method, I think I ended up, I must have applied to, let's say I applied to 50 jobs and I think I got five interviews. So that's pretty good, I think. Well, if you, um, um, let's say you, okay, so you were only applying for jobs in the marketing field, right? Yeah. So would you ever tailor your CVs towards a particular job or did you just keep it point blank? Because that was something I struggled so, with. Uh, yeah. So cover letters, I did tailor it, but... Um, when you're applying to similar jobs, it's quite easy to, to tailor your your uh, cover letter and stuff. Right. You could just replace words and uh, in in because oh, that was something else I put a lot of time into writing a really good cover letter. Um, and you know, uh, there are some basic kind of persuasion principles you can use if you read the book uh, Influence right. by Robert Robert Cialdini. There are seven principles of persuasion in there, which is so simple and easy to put in there in your CV and stuff. So you could use stuff like that. But yeah, cover letter, I, I put a lot of time into getting that good because I thought if you if I spend like 10 hours on my CV and cover letter, yeah. that's going to make all the rest easier. Uh, it means when I'm applying, I'm applying with some kind of confidence that I'm doing my best in terms of that. I think that's, what's, uh, that's pretty uh, profound really because it does show how much you want to get something if you've invested that much time in it I think a lot of the difficulty mm. I faced was because it was you're quite focused in what your goal was in terms of this is the path I want to take in terms of marketing etc when yeah, I true. when I started I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do so any yeah. job that I was like oh I could probably have a go at that I would I would mm. try at least and tailor my experiences towards that but it's so yeah. exhausting tailoring a, yeah, uh, right. an application for every single job 
because they're so right, varied. Yeah. If I was applying, I don't know, similar to you, like just to marketing or just to this specific thing, then it would be a very, not copy and paste, but you know, like you said, easier to tailor. So I think yeah, if, no doubt. if people could, you know, you're right, if people could set a goal early on, then it would be easier mm. for them and less exhaustive. Mm. What, what I did actually was, I was not actually pursuing a career in marketing at the time. Right. Right. I just wanted a job. Okay, so I thought I, I looked at my kind of experience and I looked at my education. And by the way, I don't have any degree or anything in marketing. Yeah? Right. Um, and I just thought, what, what, what can I kind of exaggerate a little bit? What can I push to the front, you could say, uh, that will be most impressive? Right. And my conclusion was, was that I have the most hands on real life experience in marketing. It's not much experience, but that's the one I've right. got the most of. That's why I pushed that to the front of my CV and I applied for marketing roles, right? And by the way, a friend of mine actually is looking for jobs recently and he's got the, that kind of uh, problem right. or challenge, which is he doesn't have a field that he can say he's specialized in and he looks specialized in, yeah. right? So I told him, look, you've taught English a little bit. You've got a CELTA thing. So push that to the front and just apply for English teaching jobs. Right, like, yeah. you, you, even though you don't have that much experience, but it's the best you can do. It shows, I think that's what people, uh, employees are looking for, is people who look specialized mm. in something, you know, in something. Like, for example, I've got a master's degree in uh, urban design. Yeah. Right? Now, I, I, I could, that's probably my biggest asset in, in the sense where it's in one of the top, 10 or 20 unis in the world and uh, it's it's a master's degree right but i actually didn't push that to the front because i don't have experience to match it yeah. which means i don't look specialized in it of course of course you know so i think that's a good thing uh, i mean i was uh, i was uh, employing people recently i'm looking for someone and loads of people were telling me i can do everything and that's that put me off yeah. actually because I, it doesn't convince me that you can do something that i'm looking for very good if you can do everything yeah yeah, no doubt. You know. I was going to ask you though. I don't know if this is part of mm. what you want to talk about, but so two questions: Did you actually ever get a job in marketing through your applications? Yeah, so I said I did. I got it through an application I did on LinkedIn. Right, and I want to discuss maybe because I've always thought about marketing, right? And I had an opportunity mm. to when I was doing pure XI the yep. sort of marketing stuff that I inherently picked up, I personally believe that I did well at, you know, and I did push that yeah. and I did apply for a lot of marketing stuff because of that. And I have um, mm. I have family abroad that, in Dubai actually, that um, really, really, really strong in marketing and, you know, yep. got very well off from it. But my, mm. my worry was that when you're marketing a product that necessarily isn't yours, you have, mm. you have a little lack of control over what you... Like your your, uh, what's the best way of saying it? You know how you, the method of you marketing that. For example, like you've got you know music and using women and using. Do you understand these things that these yeah. roadblocks? And I wanted to ask you if you ever come up against stuff like that, and how did you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. So definitely, man. Um, that's kind of part of most jobs, I guess. But yeah. Specifically, when you're advertising not just marketing or advertising specifically, it's, it's, it can be very tough. Um, the role that I took on, um, alhamdulillah, most of it was pretty clean, yeah. pretty good. Some of it I was very uncomfortable with, yeah. and uh, I kind of tried to just uh, get around it the way I could. So for example, um, my I had a colleague who had the same role as me, yep. right? So when there was something I didn't want to do, I kind of so tried to convince her to do it, uh -huh. okay? Uh, so it was like it was going to get done anyway because that's like what the company wanted right, to do, right? right. But as, uh, you know, avoid me being directly responsible for doing that stuff. That I did that type of stuff. Um, also, hmm, let me think. Also, you know, you, sometimes you get you get some kind of freedom, right? So, for example, I'm going to do an advertising campaign. I might be forced to use certain images, right. but I won't be forced to uh, the actual what I write, or maybe. It will be. Uh, it won't be my final decision which image we use. Yeah. But it will be my decision what I present as potential images. Right. I understand. Right? So just do whatever, do whatever you can, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it, it is very tough, and I, you know, I get. I'm a bit conflicted even now where I I have my own marketing agency, and we've got clients who want us to do certain things that I'm not comfortable with. 
like in that sense is like similar mm. like uh, we can obviously select the type of clients we work with which means we ha you know we won't come up with these uh, problems so much but you do find that most people will want you to post stuff that you're not comfortable with um, even even Muslims sometimes right yeah right? so um, well how do you so that's that's something I'm dealing with really right I, now I was wondering uh, um, yeah. uh, thinking about the little bubble that's developing in terms of Muslim businesses and I'm talking mm. not necessarily you know because in the UAE everybody's Muslim right more or less right. so but I'm talking maybe more Western like okay you had like pure XI and you have like other little clothing things that are Muslim run and you have you know beauty pages yeah. and all this stuff that are little mm. independent Muslim businesses um, that generally market towards practice and Muslims do you think yeah. that that is a beneficial for someone who who like yourself runs a marketing agency or mm. do you think it's counterproductive because only because um although you know i i do commend muslims for starting up their own businesses with the correct ethics and morals and stuff i also yeah. reluctant i am sometimes reluctant to work with them because of some unprofessionalism or this fee mm. la attitude where everything's as cheap or as free as possible do you understand mm. and then it's not yeah. yeah so what do you think about that Okay, so let me think how many Muslims we have as clients. Actually, most of our clients are Muslims, but they're not in the Muslim industry, right. if you know what I mean. Right, yeah. Uh, so uh, they would, uh, but, but even though they're Muslim, yeah. I don't know how strict they are in terms of uh, what they're happy to show and not show. Of course. Um, uh, for example, they they would probably want you to put on social media something about Christmas. Ah, uh, yeah, okay? yeah. Like Happy Christmas or What are you doing for Christmas? What are you doing for Christmas? Maybe that's less, uh, that's more innocent. But anyway, so they would probably want you to do that. Now, if you went to them and said, "Look, I'm not really uh, comfortable doing that." Yeah. I don't know how much pushback we would get. Mm. Really, um, not too sure. But the thing is, it creates this kind of uh, resistance or barrier where they're. They're trying to just run their business. They, they're trying to trusting you to kind of help grow their business. And then you're coming with this stuff. Oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do of this. Course, yeah. But I think it might build up to like, are we working together or are you working against me? Yeah. I don't know. That, yeah. I kind of feel a little bit like that. Yeah. But in terms of, in terms of uh, working in the Muslim industry, I find uh, there aren't many... Um, businesses that are big enough yeah. to actually use a marketing agency mm. they wouldn't be able to afford it it just wouldn't make sense for them yeah. right you need to grow to a certain level before you employ uh, staff and employ an agency you know of course, of course. Um, so so I, I, I don't I mean actually recently we, we got a new client who is directly in the Muslim uh, market right, right? Um, they they had a, you know a decent budget and so they could afford it and and we're going to start working together from January inshallah. Sure. Um, but you know it's pretty rare. But um, do you find it's it pretty rare? Do you find? I mean, I know it hasn't actually happened yet, but would you imagine it being easier working for them, like working? Yeah, together? definitely. Yeah? Because I'm motivated to help them beyond making them just money. Right. That's one thing. Yeah. Um, and also, I'm happy to help them make money. Um, and generally, we're going to be more aligned in it mm. in terms of uh, what images we're using, what we're actually promoting, because mm. we're promoting something good, but right? So it just, that makes me comfortable. What, what, what worries me sometimes is, um, I know we're going on a bit of a tangent, but I think it's relevant. It's mm. when we were talking last episode about this whole idea of Ihsan and you know mm. really working towards your contracts and that what puts me off sometimes and everybody knows this and i've you know i've got friends that are graphic designers muslim graphic designers i've got friends obviously making clothes i've got friends doing all sorts and we both you know we know we know these people together um and they all complain about the lack of uh commitment that muslims have with each other or the fulfilling of the contracts or do you understand like it's, yeah. it's just general yeah, unprofessionalism true that puts mm. you off that's, that's what i was yeah. trying to get at is you yeah. know it, there is this worry that yes um ideally and more realistically our goals and ethics will be aligned but is mm. our motivation our work ethic going to be aligned and that's yeah, what yeah, i struggled with true. a lot with pure xi the reason why i you know and it's no secret to many people that i didn't you know most of it on my own but mm. whenever i did bring people in a lot of the time it was mm. very difficult in terms of getting that sort of 
you know I, yeah. I'm giving as much as I can because it's my it's my child it's my little baby you know but mm. someone else might not have that kind of I don't know enthusiasm or motivation but then yeah, you know yeah. it, it's 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 this sign of cultivating some sort of professional mm. Muslim mindset okay you know? a few things about that so it, I think if we were only working with uh, Muslim owned businesses we might struggle no, yeah. uh, with that maybe yeah. but also I think uh, it, it works the same when you're getting a job as well yeah. is that you have to filter out who you're working with mm. right so we have a process to filter out people who aren't serious so just our pricing will filter out people who either realistically they can't afford it even though they really want it yeah. I will also filter out people who aren't that serious because we have so we have contracts and we 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 kind of we, we try to scare them away if you like we say things that will scare people that aren't serious away right, yeah. right? so uh, in the in the short term that might lose us money but in the long term it's better in terms of headache and all of that right right um, and the you could do the same with your job right so you could you know even if you're in the marketing field and you're worried about uh, having to do things you're not comfortable with you can still filter out the ones that you feel you can assume will be you'll be more comfortable with you know go on their website and see how they present themselves and uh, you know you, you try and feel the atmosphere maybe when you go for an interview mm. is it a kind of formal atmosphere or is it very casual atmosphere which you might feel more uncomfortable with of course although being casual might actually be better as well I don't know um, but yeah I suppose yeah. The, so, the difficulty really is um, with mm. marketing I suppose it's a I hope this is relevant to people listening I suppose it is because it is it does touch upon a lot of things um, yeah it, it is it's the idea that marketing in general is so inundated now with um with norms that are mm. generally unethical in terms of a muslim perspective that um it, it, that's what put me off immediately like i commend you for, for going there and challenging that field i really do i didn't go that mm. towards that direction because i didn't think i'd be able to manage it but i can see what you're doing and i actually think you know if anyone can can challenge that you know that sort of brick wall of norms and maybe you can because what it is is you know mm. you watch okay you can watch tv for you know five minutes just watch the adverts and it's always this like every advert has to have music in it that's you know the norm yeah. and then when it comes to particular things it's like well sex sells and uh you know put women in a certain you know use objectify yeah. women to sell your product that kind of thing and you you just yeah. think about any sort of product or any sort of service i mean what was mm. the recent one I saw this one recently of, uh, you know, Trivago, the hotel yeah. thing, right? There are posters yeah. all over London at the moment just about this, you know, telling you to, to go on their website. And there's nothing on there apart from a logo and just a woman. Just a woman. Nothing to do with traveling at all. <laughs> really? Honestly, it's yeah. just a woman. And people are actually wondering. I was reading it on Twitter because it was, for some reason, they they must have invested too much on posters. And there was posters plastered one after another all over, like, the tube. But right. it was just one picture of this woman. That was it, and she wasn't dressed, in, you know, you know, quote unquote, immodestly or whatever. But she's just standing there, white background, and then the mm. logo of Trivago. And it and it it just shows you like what is the purpose for that? It's it's you know it is what we said it is. So what is their thinking behind yeah, that? It's crazy. Yeah, but that, that you know, and I think we've become so accustomed and used to it that actually yeah. sometimes the most eye catching. Um, I catch an advert is the one that is quite silent and quite mute because you're used mm. to just hearing constant 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 that the moment you yeah. um the moment there's a bit of quiet you're like oh what's that like is my tv broken <laughs> do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, I'm i'm still working through the whole uh the whole thing really man yeah. like, i'm i email uh I email people that I kind of trust their advice on in terms of what is right and wrong right. uh, to try and get an idea of how to navigate this. Yeah. Because I'll give you a big uh, conundrum that you come up against when you're marketing is that, um, you know, the, the most effective marketing shows the uh, outcome of using the, your product, right. right? So, for example, your product is, I don't know, um, I, let me think, something pretty neutral like... Uh, Let's say you're you're just selling a flipping coffee mug. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go on. You're selling a coffee mug. Yeah. Now the best way to kind of promote this coffee mug, uh, based on like marketing principles, you know, tried and tested and everything, is to use images of 
happy people using that coffee mug right. basically yeah this is very basic but this is this is the thing so um so if the if the product let's say this coffee mug is for women let's say it's something about it uh -huh. makes it more targeted towards women you're going to use a woman with the coffee mug and, uh, you know smiling or happy or whatever right? right maybe sitting with her family sitting with friends enjoying life and that because you're selling the the end result of course. Right? and the end result is that you're supposed to be happy because you got this coffee mug right um now uh, this is this is where i'm conflicted because like th what does that mean does that mean that when you use men uh you only use men or what what about mm. like firstly women spend more than men g in general so what do you do you just exclude uh women also what the guidelines is very specifically around women like if a woman is covered but you're showing her face yeah is that okay yeah. like I i'm i'm really still exploring this area yeah. and obviously I'm, I'm uncomfortable showing women at all because I just wouldn't like that for my family, and I, I yeah. don't. I yeah. wouldn't like it, Yanni, of and course. it's uncomfortable. So it's it's a it difficult, difficult one, and I'm still working. I don't mean it. to bring it up as if like to bait you out, but it's just a discussion, you know. I just thought because it's a similar thing. I mean, um, this is what I'm assuming a lot of service providers feel. You know, anyone providing mm. a service, uh, whether it's graphic design or creative media or whatever, if that is mm -hmm. your field, then I feel like a lot of yeah. practicing Muslims bo like feel boxed in that they can only. I mean, how many graphic designers that me, do me and you know that only exclusively work for Dawa companies or Dawa organizations mm. because yeah. they it, maybe struggle to find anyone um, who you know they can feel comfortable working for creating for to the mm. point where all of their experience now revolves around Dawa and they can never get out of that because if you went to coca-cola for example to do some graphic design for them and you showed them the, your portfolio and it's all you know muslim mm. Dawa missions and stuff um yeah what is the perception there like that it's, it's, it's not very i don't know not very professional yeah, you can looking. assume that it won't get you the job yeah coca -Cola, <laughs> yeah maybe. so i think i mean although but sometimes as well if you're if you're just that sick they'll they'll look over that maybe yeah yeah inshallah potentially it's a, it's a decision like i wanted to get your understanding of whether it's worth is it worth um you know attacking the wall so to speak and trying to change the norms of society on a one-man mission or it, i think you've got to do half half yeah sorry go ahead no oh yeah and obviously is it or is it the opposite where you cultivate the muslim mind to, and cultivate mm. the muslim communities and the muslim right. you know what i mean i think firstly bro like uh, we don't work for like huge companies no no doubt and so so th therefore we uh, we can avoid a lot of this stuff mm. but also um I think, uh, you know, as a Muslim, you have to turn down some level of money of in order to be picky about who you're working with. Yeah. So it's simple as that. Uh, now, how much, how much you actually, money you have to give up to do that will depend. If you're a graphic designer only working for like DAO organizations, you're giving up loads of money. You're probably at least halving your income by doing that. Mm. But what we've found so far, and we're only a year old, what we found so far is that we haven't really had this trouble so far right. because we're working sometimes with we're working with medium small medium businesses and uh, you know so far it's not been that bad alhamdulillah but we'll see how it goes right. Right? we'll see sure. and, and we will have to like for example we were t we were discussing who we want to go after in terms of clients right right and we were thinking uh, we could we could help gyms a lot but then we specifically didn't go after gyms because we know gyms are going to ask us to use certain well, images yeah, that we're not that's comfortable that's exactly with. what i was thinking earlier when i was you know thinking of examples the gym mm. gym scene came into my head because mm. um, as far as cult, like gym culture and personal trainers and actual gyms you know advertising themselves i feel like it's only in recent years have we seen this explosion of um, personalities on social media that are mm. personal trainers but they'll put themselves out there and do their own do you understand um so yeah. you'll have instagram accounts influencer of, kind yeah, of yeah yeah social influencers and stuff like that and then the gym sort of partner up with those influencers and yeah. uh, there is that you know and then there is an element of uh, I don't know chauvinism to it and maybe sometimes you know using women in a provocative way to show other women this is how good you could look at our gym or you you know follow yeah, right. my diet or this kind of thing so it's 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 quite an ethical minefield really isn't it it's um definitely, right. it's, definitely. It's, and this is this is the I do I feel like though you know 2018 
like we've got to this we've got to this place and there's no going back so how do we deal with it like mm. it's completely new territory mm. that's basically what i'm trying to say yeah. the last the last 50 years or so it's just brand new this whole images everywhere video everywhere yeah. advertising everywhere it's new territory yeah. and the muslim is the muslim at least living in the west and living in uh, so called uh, developed countries yeah. they're going to find it hard to escape from it so what do you do like honestly I, I think I would definitely find it hard to advise hmm. people in general about this topic I was um, I was really sort of hell bent on when I was doing Pure XI to really uh, stick to these ethics obviously that we have um, hmm. to the point where I realised that maybe the only way of doing it is by being so abstract in my art direction that people wouldn't hmm. notice that I'm actually do you understand? Mm. I, I challenged it to the point where Muslims would look at it, assume that it's going to be bad because mm. it's streetwear. And what is streetwear associated with? Well, it's associated with uh, music, with women, with sex, with drugs. With, do you understand? But then when you actually told the Muslim, hey, no, no, go through, go through all my marketing, all my posts and mm. tell me what's wrong. And then you go through it and you yeah. wouldn't find anything because I've framed it in a way that actually it doesn't cross any bounds. You know, and because you're good at design, you can do that. Yeah, and but people that aren't good at design, yeah, will struggle. Exactly. Like yeah. So That's it's about, I guess, using, trying to use your expertise to navigate, and also, yeah, it goes back to like last episode again. It's just trying to be a pioneer in it because if no one's done it, then mm. you can. Mm. You know, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, bro, I wanted to talk about so just let's about the whole career yeah, go on. situation. I think I think you know a lot of people are wondering whether they're in their first few years of, of working or they're they're in uni or whatever they're thinking of, about working. Like, I think um, you need to actually think of what you what the world is in demand of mm. and what you're good at, right? I don't I don't give that much importance to what you love what your dream is. Right. I think that can come after 2 to 5 years of working that can come because often what happens and I've read this uh, in a few books and it, it was convincing to me is that when you're good at something you become be, begin to like it. Right. Right. So follow what you're good at and what um, people value mm. basically. You know some people they study flipping, I don't know, museum studies or yeah, something because yeah, yeah. they love it. But then, then they, you know, there are very few uh, places where they're going to find relevant work, you know. But what if they happen to be good at uh, uh, engineering, yeah. uh, maths and physics or whatever. Yeah. So they do engineering, they get into the engineering role. And then somehow down the road, they can find their way into the whole museum yeah. thing, whether it's volunteering, whether it, whatever it is, whatever it is, you know. I've thought about that so, a lot. Uh, I've thought about it because yeah. like, okay, I, the other day I was walking, um, I don't know where I was walking. Anyway, a van went past with a face of some business owner and he was selling mm. uh, some sort of like air conditioning or electrical equipment, something like that, right? Yeah. But then I recognize the brand name because it's quite, you know, quite, um, I don't know, popular down here, right? Um, and then I thought to myself, that's the picture, because he's got a picture of himself on the truck. I was like, that guy never grew up being passionate about air conditioning units, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, you understand? Yeah. But he saw, obviously, a, a, a market. He he went for it. He's making money off it. And he's probably mm. using that money to fulfill his hobbies and his actual real goals and his real, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's how I see business as well. Like, uh, go after a market that is... Because th there are there are things that are much easier to make money off than others, mm. and some people, because they're passionate about it, they force themselves into a business which is extremely difficult to tackle. Yeah, I think instead, like business alone is already really hard. So set yourself up well by going after a market which uh, maybe has less competition or the the profit margins are huge, something like that, and then like get through your first year in business then worry like just make money first like just sell first yeah. yeah then worry about you know what you're passionate about because a lot of the time people will build good businesses maybe they could put the operations infrastructure in place so they have less time they don't have to spend as much time on that yeah and then they could do this passion business that might work or might not work it's yeah. just extremely high or risk because you, you see know? that a lot with um 
these uh, people that sort of they see it, they they know it's a trend, and they'll buy whole, wholesale and then they'll sell off. Like always, recent like the mm. fidget spinner thing, where everyone was buying yeah, fidget yeah, spinners. Yeah. No one was. Yeah, that's purely just yeah. make it, just to make money. Yeah, isn't no, it? people selling fidget spinners weren't fidget spinner yeah. fanatics. They were just people that <laughs> no, saw a market, not, yeah. you know. And I yeah, think yeah, yeah, if you do have that mindset, because then. If you do have some disposable income after that, then maybe you could start up a passion project or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and the, the passion project can be profitable, but the thing is, uh, your passion project might be extremely high risk compared to other types of businesses. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. the only thing. And uh, actually, I know a lot of lot of uh, businessmen that I know. They're they're actually really they're doing well in business. They make a lot of money, but they're not actually passionate about making money. They're not actually obsessed with being rich. They just love the process of the, the you know overcoming the challenges of business. Yeah. And they because they've got that mindset, they've made loads of money because they love the process so much. And then they actually don't spend that much of their money, right? But they just love the process. And I think that's a good mindset in business, um, in terms of being successful. Yeah. Well, do you think? Is a question for you. Do you mm. think that? I mean, I know our target our audience are Muslims, really, and maybe a lot of the people listening are Muslims. But do you think Muslims should, or are they suited to trying to develop their own thing like this, so making money for themselves? Or do you think really and truthfully it's down to the individual whether they're good at working for people or good at working for themselves? Mm. I think overall uh, a Muslim should strive to be independent of other people right definitely I think that's the overall principle now if your mindset uh, because it does come down to character and mindset I think yeah. if your character and mindset is uh, aligned with being a, an entrepreneur then that's great but it, it comes down to your individual thing you can cultivate it no doubt um, but I do think right now there's this big hype about being a business owner, right, yeah. making money online, this, 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 and it attracts loads of people. And at least half of them are just they don't they don't have the character for it, they don't have the mindset for it. And you know, after a year or two of trying, they'll fail, and then they'll go back to getting a job, right? Mm. So it's about being self-aware. That's what I'll say. Definitely, I think Muslims should definitely not ignore the idea of becoming self-employed, owning a business, etc. Definitely, it's great for a Muslim to aim to do that uh, because it, it makes you less needy of others. It actually makes you stronger. In it puts you in a stronger position. Yeah, makes your life more flexible. Um, all of these things. Um, but also you got to know yourself to know if you're lying to yourself or not. And if, if right now you, you'd be lying to yourself to say that you're entrepreneurial, no problem. You could try cultivate the mindset. Um, even working in certain businesses, it requires a, an entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. It, it requires that you take initiative um, and that you, you, you don't come to your manager with problems you just always come with solutions mm. and this kind of stuff is an entrepreneurial mindset as far as I'm concerned I always um, so, yeah. I always the thing I visualize however is that I don't like to think of Muslims as an anomaly in a or practicing Muslims as an anomaly in a uh, workforce that isn't Muslim I like mm. to always picture Muslim like the Muslim utopia of this workplace being entirely run by Muslims so if I'm somewhere where you know, I am the only Muslim in a workplace, right? I always mm. visualize it. Well, I'm I'm setting up the steps for a day where everybody in here is going to be Muslim. And how will yeah. the how will the world work if everybody was Muslim? Or how will this utopia in my head work if everyone was Muslim? Okay. You know. So I then think, well, not everyone can be an entrepreneur, and some people are suited to this, and some people are suited to that. And yes, yeah. we're going to need doctors, and we're going to need firemen, and we're going to need office workers. Do you understand? So, yeah. so it's about building this image in my head of um, how do we ch ch like set up the stage for the Muslims to sort of be Muslim in these roles, you know? Mm. Yeah, definitely. Because it, right That's now, something. because yeah. right now, when you said everyone should be independent, that is true. In, mm. And I think in this stage, in this world that we live in at the moment, that is true. But in a Muslim utopia, hypothetically, yeah. not everyone can be their own man, and we are going to need people to be Muslim and working for someone else. And yeah, yeah, that's why I said it's a general thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a general thing that uh, because. Uh, Allah, Allah, there's actually, it's a hadith Qudsi, if I remember correctly, uh, where Allah says uh, that he loves the um, Muslim which is 
kind of independent of need or not needy. Yeah. There are also hadith about uh, discouraging you from asking others yeah. for things. You know. So that's what I mean in general. Now, there are other general things that are encouraged in Islam, which not everyone will end up doing and not every Muslim can do, yeah. right? There's loads of stuff like that. So that's what I mean generally. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, bro, let's let's move on, inshallah, to uh, investing and like Muslims being financially savvy or not. Yep. Uh, what do you think? You know, from like obviously knowing Muslims and being Muslim yourself, and how do you think we are in general in terms of financially I, savviness? Um, I think uh, well, it, it, it's not just Muslims. I think at the, at this stage in the game, or you know, twentieth, twenty first century, and all that, uh, especially now. You've got this whole, I mean, look at this whole Bitcoin craze and everybody thinks they can invest in something and it's all a yeah, big hype. We'll talk about that. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and the hype machine that's rolling in. But there's very yeah. little education. Like it's something that's interest me, interested me Sorry, mm. to start investing mm. money in things. But also I'm really, really lacking education on it to the point where I feel comfortable even dabbling. And I think... That is what we lack. It we lack we lack any form of financial education. I mean, I got a message just now from um, the Sheikh of the Mosque. He's starting his the, our very first zakat workshop, right? Great. Um, in Brighton, I, apparently it's the first. I've always thought, yeah, we need one of those because I've mm -hmm. still got questions. You know. Yeah. In terms of money and in terms of Sharia economics, we don't know mm -hmm. anything. Like. And I'm not saying you, but I mean the general masses, general populace of Muslims don't really know the halal and haram to do with money. I don't know everything, obviously. And I think if we had some sort of education, like really mm. or invested, number one, investing in our education of halal and haram, that way yeah. you can invest in ideally your, your the barakah that you will have in your wealth. And then later on, you can, inv you can actually start educating yourself on you know, the, the the whole investment process and what to invest on and how much, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there are definitely two things to learn about is uh, Islamic uh, financial ethics yep. as well as the actual how-to of investing. Yeah. Um, I think it, it's, it's interesting, man, because there are certain people that, like if you look at the UK in general, all the different people in the UK, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the working class, if you like, in the UK, you find they don't know too much about finances. They're the type that get um, preyed on by these uh, companies like Wonga.com, you know, right, these, yeah. uh, what they call like payday loans, yeah, whatever yeah, they yeah. are, with like 6,000% interest on them. You know, they get preyed on properly and they get killed by that stuff, you know. Mm. Um, so there are, there are a lot of people that are, don't know what they're doing. Um, I think this is my assumption. It's half an assumption and half uh, an educated kind of guess is that the Jewish Jewish people, they kind of know about the money and they kind of teach their kids about money and they pass on that knowledge. And that's kind of been going for quite a while, um, especially in the US. Um, then I feel like Indians as well, uh, a lot of them, they know what they're doing with money. They pass on that kind of well, understanding. I think, I think to interject, I think a lot of communities, it isn't just the, these two mm. uh, these two cultures and faiths it's mm. a lot of communities are very tight-knit and do pass i mean i was looking at something about uh native americans that um mm. a lot of their well certain native americans I'm not you know washing everybody um uh, there's this sort of culture of native americans that had to sell a lot of the land that they owned to casinos or they mm. built casinos on their land but yeah. they because of that it became obviously a cultural thing within them that this is, you know, this is our business model now. This is how we we do things as a community, and mm. they shared the wealth because of that, you know. And right. because, do you think actually is an interjection? Do you think because we were so cut up and divided in terms of mm. Muslims in you know the last the last World War One or whatever that, mm. and then nationalism set in and then colonialism set in that we we're so tribal now and so divided that. Mm. There is this, you know, the idea of sharing wealth and stuff like that is so uh, lacking, I suppose. Mm. I'm not sure at all, to no? be honest. I mean, <laughs> it's a, it's I, I a... no, I, I, no I, I just don't know. Like, yeah. uh, in terms of unity, I mean... It's easy to talk about. Like, it's all roses, yeah. isn't it? It's all roses yeah. talking about that stuff. And I, I do feel like it's a straw man argument to keep saying that. But... 
it is there sort of in the back of my head that a lot of other communities are very you know a lot of other communities i suppose are quite thinned out aren't they whilst our communities still seem to be stuck within this uh, country based thing you know where what country are you from and then it's what tribe are you from i mean algeria alone yeah. algeria alone to take an example you've got obviously the book that was it the um sorry you've got like arabs and you've got berbers and you've got this amazir, amazir yeah. sorry that's what i'm looking for uh yeah. and it and there is that sort of i mean i'm seeing it in my wife's family sometimes uh she's uh her family amazir and mm. uh I think when certain people are looking to get married to someone else, they're always trying to find, you know, someone from the same sort of. Yeah, you, know, you know what it is, bro. It's actually this is what this is what I uh, I actually get annoyed about when it comes to this is where I feel it's legitimate to complain about uh, countries meddling in our countries. Right. Okay? Yeah. Because this is because you know people say. Oh, should France pay Algeria for the damage they did when they colonized? Should France apologize? I say no. I say, look, I don't, I don't value your apology enough to even want it. Yeah? Right. And then the money, halas, we'll forget the money. You know, pay it back, yawm al qiyama. Yeah. Yeah. But the, but, but in terms of the the problem that I do have is until today they're meddling in our countries. So, for example. Um, People have been found, like different people, uh, you know, Mossad agents and right. uh, from other countries have been found trying to stir up problems in Algeria between different ethnicities and different sects and stuff. Right. This is what drives me nuts. This is this is the one place where I do blame those foreign governments for what they're doing. Right. Other than that, I blame ourselves always. Yeah. But this is the this is a problem we have in a lot of our countries is there are always these foreign elements trying to stir up division yeah other than that i feel like we would be on the road to kind of unity and healing between inside our countries and between different countries i think you know? if you uh i think another thing as well is that um i mean we, we talk a lot about north africans perspective because we're north african i guess both of us uh and because yeah. we were colonized a lot and we were talking just earlier about how you know, Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to not be needy of anyone but him, right? Mm. And I strongly believe that in a post-colonial era, we are very needy of the West, not only well, not only Europe or our past colonizers, but also mm. their approval. So not just their resources, mm. but their approval and their, you know, it's just like... A, you see, like in Tunisia, for example, I know we're straying from money, but it's all, it's all, it's all linked, isn't it? In yeah, Tunisia, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in Tunisia, for example, there's a road, that, there's this long road that's built by the Arabs, by the Tunisians, and then there's this long road that was built by the French, like a hundred years ago, or whatever, okay. right? Yeah. And despite the fact that, um, you know, the, the 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 Tunisian road is newer, right? And mm. we still take the old French road. Like everybody wants to take okay. the old one. Everyone praises this old French road. Like it's just a little example, but it, it carries on into buildings, into structures, into. But is the French road better though? Yes, this is the thing. This is what I'm trying to get at. The mm. fact is, yeah. why is it that this road is better when we have the resources, we have the time? It's because we cut corners and we're not professional with what we yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, it, and, it, and, and it goes back to this mentality, isn't it? Of we're just uh, we just cut corners to try and. Get mm. get to places yeah. quicker. When really, yeah, this is a you know, look at look at look at this look at the civilizations that uh, maybe we we admire as North Africans, right? Like they admire the French and they admire this. Well, the, the French had their revolutions and they had their their um, struggles, and they weren't not everybody was where they are today, you know. And it took a long time. We don't need to cut corners Definitely. to get there. It's just about patience and about doing the best we can with what we have. Yeah. Everyone holding themselves accountable. Yeah, you know my. Uh, I remember my cousin said about uh, Wahran. Wahran is the second biggest city in Algeria. Yeah, and it means two lions. But anyway, uh, I think there were lions in Algeria before. But anyway, yeah, most likely. Um, he's like, if an earthquake hit this city, the only thing that would be left is the French buildings. Oh God, it's true, though, isn't it? It's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's true. But I mean. It's nothing to do with being Muslim or no, being no. Arab yeah, or whatever. Yeah. It's just uh, our mindset could be could be improved, and of course, it takes time, Annie. Yeah. Uh, but the thing I guess that's annoying is that we acknowledge we've got the best guidance, and we know we got the potential because we got that guidance. But you know, we need to really. Well, yeah. That. Let's take it back to the fundamental principle we're trying to get at here: is that um, 
I don't remember who said it. I think it was Omar radiallahu anhu, but isn't it along mm. the lines of uh, you know, that nothing will nothing will uh, give victory to this ummah apart from that which gave victory to it, you know, mm. beforehand. You know, meaning yeah. you know nothing but Islam will bring you honor and victory. And mm. it's it's funny because you know the elders of our community will talk about the old the old days in terms of you know times of the sahaba and that and like i've had it my yeah. grandparents or my dad or whatever will say oh you know back in you know back in the day the arabs were this mm. and the arabs were that and the muslims did this and we discovered that and we did yeah. and yeah. then and now you just we're completely oblivious as to why we had that success you know mm. and we just yeah. we're chasing the illusion that's set up before us in terms of mm. this uh you know modern quote unquote era mm. you know so why this is what we're trying to get at with these two episodes really and you can agree if you want is the fact that it's really about being muslim like not just you know calling yourself muslim and, and doing business and making money yeah. and that it's about really really being muslim about it really mm. like ticking the boxes of islam in everything you do yeah that's what will make you a baller no doubt <laughs> yeah um, but i think you know bro things are things are, are definitely better i think you know actually just now, before we start this call, someone sent me uh, an in kind of uh, image, a poster about an, an event that's going on uh, in London. Right. Islamic principles of investment. Right. One day seminar, digital assets, cryptocurrencies, stocks and shares, forex trading, Ooh. you know, like educational seminar kind of thing. So, you know, I've, and I've seen multiple of these, you know, not to mention uh, National Zakar Foundation. They've been kind of pioneers in this kind of stuff as well. And their stuff is seems proper, legit, very, you know, professionally done. And I, I trust because, you know, sometimes sometimes you'll be listening to a sheikh about this stuff and you're kind of questioning whether he really understands business and finance. But but then you are seeing more and more. Uh, people specialize in finance and the Islamic side and they can kind of trust them so that's really good and uh, yeah so I just think things are getting better obviously in general education is becoming more and more open so I can access some of the best investors in the world and get advice from them yeah uh, you know I couldn't do that you know 10 years ago so that's really good for everyone including Muslims so there is definitely positive things um, but I think I see some specifically like Indian Muslims in the UK. They seem to be very on point with their money handling and their business. Like they generally seem to re be really good. I think Arabs are not quite there right now. Um, yeah. Le uh, Lebanese Palestinians they got the trading in their blood. Really, but <laughs> yeah. Us, uh, us, uh, you know, North African stuff. I don't think. Uh, well, I, I like to right think now. like I, you know what I think it is. It's because um, a lot of North Africans came to this country or came to Europe etc with a mindset of mm. sending everything back home you know? yeah uh, whilst there are yeah, a lot suppose, of yeah. you know, there are a lot of people a lot of you know uh, immigrants that came to this country wishing to set up in this country and then to invest mm, like true. my dad came here and um, you know he had the choice didn't he like to either invest here or to take everything mm. back home and he sent everything mm. back home you know mm, because he yeah, had family yeah. there and a lot of a lot of teenagers that came over you know, during his age, he must have come here when he was 17 or something. Um, yeah. You know, they still had a lot of family back home and they felt obliged to send stuff to them, you know. And that's, course, that's, that's how normal, it sets up, yeah. yeah. But there are a Actually, lot... I think every Arab went to the UK thinking they weren't going to stay. I think that yeah, 90% yeah. of Arabs had that mentality. Yeah. But there are a lot of Arabs that, or a lot of immigrants in general, yeah, that completely staying. end up staying and inve investing and that's, yeah. it. that's their goal. And yeah. I will see them yeah. here. Like, there's a... The Christian Arab community, the Coptic community in um, mm. in the UK, or at least in Brighton here, as far as my, I, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, they don't have much back where they're from, like Sudan and Egypt. Um, mm. I don't know why, but that's, they made the choice to, to be here and stay here. And a lot of them have really nice houses, you know, uh, really mm. strong communities. Um, and it's, it, I guess that's it, isn't it? It's about the longevity of community remaining in a particular place and where they're actually pooling their resources. Having a long-term mindset changes a lot of things, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, no I think doubt. That, because often, you know, if you're going to, let's say, buy a house, and I wanted to talk about buying houses. If you're going to buy a house, it's like, 
how long does it take to pay off a house like 30 years like a lot of the time you're not going to benefit from the fruits of your long-term investments but your kids and grandkids will and i think it will make a huge difference to them if you do those investments now you know yeah no doubt um, go on then so bro i wanted to ask you about uh so i was talking to a friend of mine actually about uh, the 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 concept of uh, necessity yeah. in Islam. Yeah. You know, something's haram out of necessity. Of they course. could be allowed if if it's a necessity, right? So he was telling me that his dad and a lot of the Arabs in the kind of West Midlands <clears throat> in the eighties or nineties, I think in the nineties, um, some shiuch came over, I think from Egypt and right. stuff, and they they told them that. You have to buy property, like you can't keep renting. It makes you vulnerable, it makes you weak. Right. How are the Muslims gonna like grow in power uh, if 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 you don't have own your own houses and your own property and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So they basically told them like it's so important to own your own property. That's a necessity, and you could take a mortgage out for that reason. Yeah. Right. Now, my uh, now that that's interesting because they, they they obviously thought that yeah. you know, yeah. and that's why I you know you have to. It's not just about the Shari qualifications of someone. It's also the some topics are very complicated. No right? doubt, yeah. And when I've read about buying houses and stuff, there is a very, very good argument for not buying a house yeah. and how it's better financially not to own the house that you live in. Yeah. Um, buying a house to rent it out is a completely different thing, yeah. which people, they generally encourage it. But buying the house you live in, it doesn't actually always work out, right? It, it doesn't always make sense. No, so no doubt. These people, and because of that, a lot of the, a lot of these these people, they bought houses with a mortgage, thinking like, okay, it's a necessity, so it's not haram or whatever. Right. But then they haven't really. It didn't ne necessarily mean that they got like stronger and stuff mm. because of that. Mm. So mm. anyway, what do you think about like owning you know, a house? You know, when I was uh, when I started practicing and I was, you know less responsibilities and less uh, and less of a need to think about these things then I just yeah. all I knew was well it's impermissible and that's it and that's all I need to know about it you know mm. and then as uh, but that's mortgage specifically yeah yeah mortgage specifically we're talking here but then as uh, you know as you get older and you do see like okay here's an example the previous job I had um, a lot of the average age of everybody in that job was I don't know 18 ish you know, they were very young in terms of because it was a quick turnover and it was a part time job. Now that I, yeah. the job I'm in is like quite dignified, let's say, and everybody there is an adult, you know, yeah. and everybody there is talking about mortgages, talking about, you know, everyone, everyone's just, okay, I've got a mortgage or I'm looking for a place or I'm moving house. Or, these are the discussions I'm having now, and it's very new yeah. to me to be in that sort of sphere. Uh, and yeah. also, you know, I'm married now with a kid and, every, and you know, and I'm, and the, the whole, uh, rent and, and, and mortgage and houses and all that stuff like living basically in this country is extremely difficult you know and I never knew much about mortgages in terms of what people pay um, I'm sitting here listening to the people and they're like oh yeah I've got £600 mortgage £600 a month £500 a month £800 a month for, wow. you know and that's pretty low yeah. yeah and I don't you know I think there is some sort of initiative for first time buyers and all this stuff that's going okay. on but um, it, it amazed me because you know, for a lot of places here now, it's one thousand three hundred a month for uh, for 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 rent. Uh, Eight hundred and fifty. Right. Eight hundred and fifty so lowest. You could no half that if you had the, that. Yeah. At least the type of mortgage they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Half that. Yeah, and and then, and you you start to think, bloody hell, maybe you know, maybe it is easier. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe it is necessity, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like right now, uh, it is difficult, and you know, I'm yeah. You know, I, I, you know, it's not no shame to say it. I'm still living with uh, my mum. You know, that's mm. that's what a lot of people have done now, like get to get married, mm. have a kid, and stay with the family as long as possible um, mm. until they can find some sort of alternative. Right now, it's which, by the way, is not necessarily a bad thing. No, no, not at all. To In fact, it's for me at the moment. It's more practical, not just for me, but for for mm. them as well. Because, like I said, my dad's in Tunisia, etc. So he's sort of taking yeah. care of things over there. They need a man around, and that's the that's the role you sort of play. Mm. Um, but in terms of other people, people struggling really, and and I'm you yeah. know I'm you know I can't stay here forever so to speak. So mm. to think of the you know the practicalities and necessities of of it is you know isn't as black and white as you you, you may think it was. And there you know it's true. Yes, people will get angry with that. People will say, well, no, it's oh, right, haram. And I do believe it's impermissible the way the mortgages are set up at the moment. I do believe it. But there are some people that don't have a choice. 
you know mm. up into a point so you're actually you're actually saying that you know based on uh, having a mortgage potentially halving the amount of money yeah. that's going out the difference is however saying, is yeah, that obviously yeah. with a mortgage yes that is a price you, you're going to end up paying right the, whatever mm. a month but you also need your odd 20,000 pounds yeah exactly and you know if you've got enough to save for that then I don't know mm. what your situation is you understand like that mm. can negate your necessity if you can save 20,000 then you can probably pay 20 months you know two years worth of rent or something do you understand I think one? if you've got a job if you've got a decent job mm. and you can afford a rent I'm, I'm struggling to see how well, it's a necessity well here's the house. thing if you've got a decent job yes mm. if you're a lot of people put like Basically, two, a lot of couples, a lot of married couples, will mm. both have to work to 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 mm. pay the average rent price in the UK, yeah. right? But then, mm. how do you feel about your wife working in a particular area or a particular? Do you understand? How easy is it for you to find a place for your wife to work that is suitable for her? You know, yeah. Like, and why should she okay, have to give my, up? My wife was her, working. Her uh, motherhood, kind we'll of. We'll go. We'll go. We'll go as personal as we can because it's, it gives a good example. My wife was working. Yeah. Um, recently mm. in um, in the in the NHS in the hospital, right? And um, obviously she just had a kid, so we you know he's, he's seven months now, etc. And it it wasn't she went. I had to drop her off at work every morning, and she was not happy leaving mm. her kid, you know, leaving our child, mm. of course, without yeah. it being there to raise him and missing out on certain things. And then also on top of that, there were certain things in the workplace that she wasn't comfortable with, like uh, men working with a lot of men or being very pally with them and do you understand like mm, that yeah. kind of atmosphere being very because it was a what was it it was like a um, small lab there would make medicine for chemotherapy and uh, okay. cancer patients and stuff but because it's quite tight knit you know it's just mm. it just it, it, it leads to sort of that kind of engagement and she didn't like that and she wouldn't engage with it and anyway so there's all these little things and I was I was of the impression that well, it's a, quite a necessity now for almost two people to have to work, you know. And mm. and I hadn't even got my my job yet, etc. Um, anyway, I'm going on a tangent. Basically, so yeah, she, she she decided it was her decision that she didn't want to work there anymore. She wanted to actually be a mum for as long as she possibly can, you know. Yeah. Until she can find something that is completely 100 percent halal if the if the time comes. So a lot of yeah. couples may face this. A lot of practicing Muslim couples may face this. Yes, it's the man's responsibility to to provide and if he can afford to provide on his own then that's brilliant but certain yeah. couples now are in a position where not only do both have to work right yeah. but then they also have to either make this decision right regarding rent or like okay if the man is working on his own can they afford to yeah. rent you know right but if the woman you understand it's basically cash 22 and it's what are the impermissibilities that you're going to have to dabble in to survive sometimes you know right mm. But that's obviously assuming that uh, the monthly cost uh, with a mortgage is lower than rent. Assuming, yeah, and also, but it, and it, it, is that always the case? Because I don't really know. Apparently, it is. But then again, it excludes certain things such as the down payment. It excludes certain things yeah. such as uh, repairs, and you know, because once yeah. the house is yours, and you're responsible for yeah. fixing it and doing yeah, all yeah, sorts, you know. Yeah. yeah, let me let me give you my what I've read about the downsides of buying a house that you live in. Yeah, go on. Okay. Um, and I got this mostly you can you can check it out uh, if you just search uh, something like uh, why I will never buy a house and then uh, the name oh man what's this guy's name uh, 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 James Altucher that's it okay uh -huh. so you can read this uh, kind of blog post so basically what he says and a few other people have similar arguments what he says is firstly buying a house is Usually, people that are buying a house, they're putting far too much of their net worth into one asset. Right. Okay. So it's the opposite of diversification. All of your, you know, hopes for for money wise and all of that is going into one thing. Okay. Second thing is that asset, you, it was so called asset. I'll get to that. Uh, so uh, that thing you've just bought, it's uh, illiquid, meaning it's hard to turn it into cash. Right. It's hard to sell a house compared to selling stocks, for example. Yeah. yeah? Uh, the other thing is, it's it, people think a house is a an investment or an asset, but it's actually a liability because, like, anyway, according to the definition that I like, is uh, uh, an asset is something that puts money into your bank account every month. Right. right? 
but uh, a house is the opposite. You're putting money into it every month mm. by paying uh, for the mortgage, right? So it's not actually a, an asset. Um, on top of that, you're, you're stuck in one place now that you've bought this house, yeah. and everyone knows that you probably will have to move for jobs. So what, what are you going to do about that, yeah. right? Uh, then you've got to pay for um, any, any fixes you need done, right? Yeah. And you've got taxes and all that. And then also you got that big down payment, which I think in England, a lot of people, they, they got a man and woman both working full time to save up a huge amount for this down payment. Yeah. And they're putting all their savings into a down payment. Again, putting all their cash money into like one uh, thing, one so-called investment, right? So when you add, uh, not to mention, uh, this is something additional. As Muslims, we like avoid debt. Like it's halal oh, to yeah. borrow money, but you should avoid it. Yeah. So you're just signing up to like 30 years of debt voluntarily. Yeah. yeah. So that's another problem. And then obviously you got the whole riba kind of thing. So, uh, so that, those are right, the, the big reasons why it doesn't actually make sense to own a house, that you, especially that you live in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, okay. now the thing is, uh, so how do you do it though? Because as Muslims, we should think of our children. We should think of ownership. We should think of empowering ourselves. So how do we go about it? So far, without having researched deeply into this, my kind of strategy is focus, instead of fo trying to buy a house like now, especially when I'm quite young and stuff, yeah. focus on increasing my income as much as possible mm. until that down payment or buying the house full out cash or whatever becomes possible or that it doesn't become such a huge amount of my net worth mm. going into one thing. Well, that's the thing, and like is what the average, okay, the average house now is how much? million isn't it no, or like no idea, half a man. million 200 Brighton, quarter of a million probably, yeah it's ridiculous amount yeah, of money 300 so, 400 yeah so 300 400 thousand let's just mm. say because that is a ballpark figure which you know i'm sure exists you know mm. at what point are you going to be able to make that much money yeah um i mean i do think you can do it if if your focus is on actually making more money because most people don't focus on making more money yeah. most, most people they for example they'll just go get a job they'll work in that job yeah they'll be like okay with the security it gives them or whatever but they won't focus on how do i increase my skills so i can add more value to the company yeah. so that i can get a raise so i can get a promotion mm. right Instead, they do the same job day in day out, and they think well, it's upon my manager to give me a promotion. Yeah, right. Instead, you should be proactive and think, what can I do to um, yeah, like to, to kind of deserve that promotion yeah, as well. I suppose and, like it, it comes down to this: how can I make my company more money so then I could get a cut of that? Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. So it's it, it's part of a mindset, and I'm sure. I mean, I know there are there is at least one course that I know by someone that I trust an uh, online course about specifically how to get a raise yeah right so um, you know if you, if you think about that like just how do I just make more money and worry less about saving little bits of money here and there and worrying about rent focus 100% on making more money mm. over a 5 to 10 year period of course uh, although it can work in 2-3 years um, you know focus on that and I think you could get there not to mention, if you if you learn about investing, then your part of your income can be, come from those other investments as well as your salary. Yeah, right? I do so. believe that that's you know that is a, a very good avenue in terms of investing. I think everyone should have a little look into that. I say little, they should really try and educate themselves a lot. I've been meaning to for God knows how long, um, mm. and I just didn't really know where to start. I mean, I've got brokers accounts, I've got all sorts of stuff set up, and it's just sitting there. Because I yeah. haven't really, I haven't felt confident or comfortable enough to take a dive, you know. Yeah. But um, you know, you know, the world's your oyster, and there's still time ahead. So yeah. learning is is cheap, right? Learning just takes a bit of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, ten pounds for a book, right? So yeah. um, also, I want to I want to mention a few kind of resources. There is a website called Investify, which is run by. Uh, Ustad Joe Bradford, he's from the US, he's a graduate of Medina, I believe he graduates from a college of Hadith. Right. Um, he's like uh, specialized in like finance, Islamic ethics, as well as um, 
like investing in general, right? So he right. consults for different companies. So he's got this as well as his partner, like they set it up together. Yeah. Um, so that is a service where you pay fifty dollars a month, and they give you what the, they give you their suggestions on what stocks to invest in. So that's something interesting, Annie, because every stock they recommend is going to be halal based on their criteria. So that's pretty cool, something new. So that's interesting. Also, there's the book uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad, which is pretty uh, good place to start. Even though maybe some of the advice in there is questionable, but it's it's a good way to start looking at finances. And uh, there's another book I think I'm going to read. I haven't read, but it looked good. Someone recommended it, which was Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, something like that. Right. So again, it's like just personal finance stuff. So basic reading could perhaps uh, help a lot down the line. So. You, I, you know, from what I'm gathering is that for the for the person who's stripped down, you know, very first step, you believe that mm. best thing to do is is start reading, really, isn't it? Yeah, read a few of these books, yeah, which cost ten pounds each, isn't it? Mm. Um, read some of those books, and then the next stage, perhaps before you even have to invest any money, any big amount of money at all, read those books, and there's a course by someone called Ramit Sethi, uh, R-A-M-I-T-S-E-T-H-I, Ramit Sethi. Um, and the course is uh, called, uh, he's got a course called Dream Job. So it's about how to get dream job with a good salary and all that negotiation advice, all that stuff. A lot of it is America based, but I think it, the principles apply everywhere. And he's got some other courses I can't remember the word, on how to get promoted and these. So you can get smart about this stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so those are some things. Brilliant. What about cryptocurrency? <laughs> what about? I'm kind, of, I'm kind of inside that world, yeah? <laughs> so you, I'm assuming you're an outsider to the world. So what, do you, what are your impressions of it? My impressions, uh, I feel like um, just missed out on it, I think. I think it's too late for really, me. Yeah. yeah, I think it's too late to even. And number one, forget that. Forget about that. I don't even know the permissibility of it, you know. And a lot of people are questioning that. Some yeah. people, some people, from what I've seen, have got the opinion that, um, well, if it's treated like a currency, because even the currency we have today isn't the real currency that the Shadow is talking about in terms of paper mm. money, in terms of you know, you know, numbers going up in your bank, your bank account. Like that's not tangible yeah. wealth, really, is it? It's just a representation, yeah. an IOU, so mm-hmm. to speak, of what the actual wealth yeah. is represented. And if that's mm-hmm. the case, then what's what's the difference between the numbers flipping in your bank account, you know, on your phone or something, and you know, a digital currency like Bitcoin or whatever the rest yeah. are? Yeah. Okay. Well, you definitely didn't miss out. I mean, you could still get in, definitely. <laughs> uh, I think. I think it's not. Um, it, it's still very early, like it's extremely early because um, none of these currencies are being used for real life yeah. kind of uses right now. Most people are buying just as an investment. But inshallah, like if, if it starts getting implemented, for example, buying online, you could use these currencies or using some of the abilities they have like smart contracts or whatever. Yeah. Then, um, then the price is going to jump massively. Like the price has jumped massively. Uh, Bitcoin, for example, has jumped massively without anyone using it yet. Yeah. So what about when it does get used, you know, in real life? Um, so yeah, man, it's definitely early days still. Very early. I'm on. Days. A, I'm on I just typed in a website that I remember hearing about called Coinbase.com. Buy and sell digital yeah. currency. Yeah, that's the kind of uh, most well-known place to buy Bitcoin. Um, they, you know, during this uh, hype in December, where um, everyone like it was, I think Bitcoin was all over the news, especially in America. Yeah. Um, Coinbase was adding a hundred thousand new users every day. Oh yeah. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. Crazy. I I've uh, I got into cryptocurrency in June. Yeah. So end of Ramadan, and uh, I I only had the confidence to get into it really because. I, I, did, I was able to join this WhatsApp group of uh, um, there's about 50 uh, Muslim uh, guys who are all I think most of them are like uh, business people right and uh, some of them traded in the past like traded currency or uranium or some of these things so we got some decent advice going on in there yeah and we kind of helping each other learn and so uh, I got in but uh, you know they gave a very good principle uh, for investing in something so high risk as, as cryptocurrency, which is don't invest more than you're willing to lose. You know, yeah. 
because it's extremely high risk. It could it could disappear tomorrow, right? There's yeah. nothing guaranteeing. Like a government could could say it's not allowed, or um, well, it's not the, the actual used, exchange where you buy it can get just t- shut down. Well, bit, right? Bitcoin price at the moment is at ten thousand two hundred eighty-two pounds for one coin. Yeah, and then the cr- the price can crash as well because it moves very quickly. Yeah. So um, so it's extremely high risk, which means you know don't put too much money into there. As I've got more confident, you could say I put more and more in, but. Um, I I just put in on a monthly basis of uh, such a small amount that if it goes to zero, it won't annoy me at all because it, it, overall it's like a actually overall it's a decent amount, but a monthly it's not much, right? So it's a good uh, kind of thing to follow. In terms of per- permissibility, um, initially my kind of red flag went off like or oh, currency finance this dodgy this like that's my assumption at uh, the beginning always right. then I started like looking into it very few fatawa most most mashayikh are saying like we need really deeper knowledge on this before we can give any kind of ruling yeah so so I saw that then um, then a few people have written like proper long papers about this um, I think his name is Mufti Adam something. I think he's UK based. He wrote a paper on it. A um, few people have written papers, like Joe Bradford as well. He wrote uh, like an article about it, um, and he, 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 you know, he didn't. I think he said he's inconclusive about its permissibility. Or, but then again, his whole Investify thing has a membership for advice on which cryptocurrencies to buy. So I'm guessing he's saying it's fine. Um, I have not. I've only heard one person say it's haram, and their reasons kind of showed they didn't understand what it is in the first place. So, I mean, I'm comfortable that's permissible just how f- foreign currency uh, trading is permissible. You have to follow the same rules as that. Right. You know, you have to you have to know what you're doing so you don't get caught up in riba. You don't, um, uh, yeah, like this kind of stuff. But it, it seems like it's just like you said, like a foreign currency kind of thing. Yeah, I guess so. So, uh, yeah, it's just another currency which isn't backed by anything tangible just like uh pounds and and dollars and stuff uh but some people say this is more islamic because it's it's decentralized it's not based on a riba system oh, right just how you know the dollars is all based on the riba and i don't know world bank giving loans to countries and yeah, all yeah. this it's all dirty money right but um cryptocurrency is not based on that so they're saying it's better i don't know really um, also, a lot of Muslims are attracted to it because it's decentralized, which means like no one entity can control it. But then again, maybe that's a bad thing. I'm not sure. Oh, so, is a yeah. is a can of worms. But it's you know it's a it's an, a metaphor or an example even of you know certain avenues and Muslims looking on the horizon and stuff like that. You know. Yeah, I, it, a lot of people are getting hyped up about it and saying this is. This is the time in your lifetime where you could make it big, kind of thing. Right. Yeah, um, kind of like dot com bubble or whatever in uh, no, two thousand or whenever it was. Yeah, um, a lot of people made loads of money. A lot of people lost loads of money. But if you're careful, maybe you'll make a lot of money without too much risk as well. And maybe it's you know it's one of those things where any nearly anyone could get into it. So maybe it's a chance for Muslims to you know make some make some money off it. Inshallah. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Maybe if you, if you want to buy some, I'll show you how, inshallah. Oh, I'm uh, setting up my account now. I mean, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. It's all, it's, that's the thing. It's just a lack of education on my part, really. There's a lot of things like this that I just yeah. am not clued up enough, and I don't ever make time to get clued up. Mm. Yeah, and eat bit by bit, inshallah. Okay, bro. Um, I don't know if there are any other topics you want to cover. I've got one question that was sent to me. Yeah, we can blast the question quickly. Okay, inshallah. So, the question is, it was sent on Snapchat, so it's not in the email. Okay, so um, someone was asking, they say, "Mm, okay, it's my last year of uni, and I'm stuck with two paths. Right. I could take one year off, and focus on my deen, especially Quran. So I'm guessing memorizing Quran and stuff. Um, obviously, yeah, they, they say I've been in school since age, age three. So school, 
and work has always taken over my time so I want to focus on uh, hobbies and uh, Islamic knowledge and stuff right yeah and uh, she's got no loans so that's not a problem for her um, the other path is to do a master's degree and dive into the professional field and just get school over with once and for all right um, so these are the two options uh, I'm just checking if there are any other details are important. Uh, um, yeah, that's basically it. So take a year off, uh, maybe memorize some Quran, do some hobbies, uh, or go straight into a master's degree. It depends, it depends. Think of it this way. If you're taking a year off just to go back into education the after mm. that year, then what's the point? Because, you know, that whole year is either going to maybe jeopardize your education because you're not in that framework anymore mm. because because after that after that year you're essentially going to stop memorizing Quran again if you can't do it now if you can't sustain your you know learning a bit of deen now with your education then what makes you think that oh I'll do it just for I'll do it for a year and then that's it after I go back and do my masters I'm going to have to stop again you know you have to make yeah. a decision if you're going to go down the route of you know learning deen and becoming a real student of knowledge and that then that's I mean I think Mufti uh, Muhammad Munir said it didn't he like if you want to be serious then you're going to have to you can't juggle it with something else can you yeah he's hardcore yeah. yeah yeah you can you can like if you're going to be you know half half then you can probably manage that but if you want to be the best you can be in terms of student knowledge and you're going to have to go full full force I know I personally can't yeah. you know um, so it's, it's up to you but if you if you're doing this is my opinion anyway if you're doing that with the with the intention of well after this year I'm going to go back to uni anyway then really mm. to me it sounds like you're just taking a year off because you want a break it's not necessarily mm. uh, because you want to dedicate time to Dean well that's well, fine as well yeah uh, but I always I, I'm I'm with my dad on this one I don't think that taking years off is beneficial at all I just, but I, but keep in mind bro uh, like she doesn't necessarily need to have a career I don't know if she she's actually even thinking of that. Oh, well, it depends what she wants, isn't it? Or, or the goal that she wants to achieve. Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, she says she wants to do um, a master. Well, she's taking a, yeah. The thing is, she said, I'll take a year off. She didn't say, I'll stop here. She said, I'll take a year off to do this. And then I'm going to go back to uni and do a master's. Should I take a year off or should I do a master's now? Either way, the master's is in the picture, isn't it? Yeah, so that, it that sort of highlights what the goal is. To me, it sounds Maybe like the goal is just to become more educated. Yeah. If you're going to do it anyway, if your intention is mm. to do the masters anyway, then you're better off, in my opinion, starting straight off with the masters, getting that out of the way, mm. and then you mm. know spending your time with your dean. Not, not that you shouldn't spend time with dean now, but I'm saying mm. you'll have an opportunity to go full force that way. Mm. Because, yeah. because generally speaking, generally speaking, if you're going to be going to work for someone else, then you don't generally take that work back home with you but whilst you're at uni you're constantly taking that uni work back home with you and it makes it difficult to do anything else mm. Mm. you know I think there are, there is the aspect of uh, when you stop uh, education full time education you go back to it Yeah, it can be difficult and master's degrees generally are difficult Yeah, so that's something to consider um, and also it depends what you're planning on doing after your master's degree mm. Um, because if you're not planning on working, then perhaps uh, get the master's degree over with and then you're not necessarily in a hurry to get a job or whatever. So then you can uh, have, you know, organize your time uh, kind of the way you like a bit. Yeah. Um, so it depends on your on your uh, final goal. How, but if you're planning on doing a master's degree and then working, then uh, maybe it would be worth taking a year off. Uh, but make it a productive year off, you know, like uh, have something that you could show potential employers as well, mm. uh, even if it's not working. So could be um, volunteering, you know, organizing events maybe for your masjid or who knows what. Uh, it could be getting involved with some kind of DAO organization, getting involved, some kind of organization, you know. Um, and then, yeah, like uh, spend that year. Like basically, if you're going to take a year off, it's going to be difficult, I think, uh, holding yourself accountable to a certain timetable. So keep that in mind and don't assume it's going to be rosy. Mm. Right? You, you're going to, you got to avoid like wasting a lot of time. 
So if you're dreaming about memorizing memorizing Quran, um, you know you're probably going to spend up to what one hour, two hours a day memorizing Quran. What else are you going to do for, with your time? You know, yeah. you try and make it as productive as possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I only um, the only reason I'm being a bit negative. I think anyone at face value would say, "How could you say not for her not to take a year off and study Quran, etc." The reason I say that and being a little mm. negative is because from the answer of the question, you've already said that I'm doing this for one year, almost as if it's an mm. excuse to justify mm. taking a break. That's I think I think Muhammad people think that this kind of study and stuff it has to be full time right which i don't really agree with like uh you can you can memorize quran put a few hours in per week and like just do it be consistent about it and you'll be fine you know, you'll make progress as long as you're making some progress that's fine yeah um but at the same time you know what some people have told me you're trying to memorize quran like seriously yeah yeah they said if you can do an initial memorization so you memorize the whole thing but not solidly yeah and you can do that in one year um then when it comes to your second time like re-memorizing is way easier and it's something more doable part-time right right so it's and it's also a motivational thing so if you even if you memorize 15 juz in this one year it's motivational that you're halfway there and you might be more likely to continue it part-time when you're studying or working or whatever hmm. so it's good i think sometimes to do intensive stuff i know that a lot of people uh like in egypt or mauritania or whatever they have these one-year intensive things actually sometimes like six months where you just memorize a quran and you've got people holding you accountable so they're going to wake you up at fajr and you're going to have a tiny breakfast and then you're just going to memorize for like two three hours and then you're going to practice, and then you're going to revise, and then you pray dhuhr, then you do a nap, then you're going to do some other stuff. Yeah. Like there are teachers there, there are people holding you accountable, so that would be super pro productive, uh, I'm sure. It'd be a bit hardcore, but it would be really productive. So um, intensive is good sometimes, I think, because you got to be, uh, uh, again, it's self-awareness, because Muhammad, you're saying, it's a good point that you make, really, like, if you don't make time for it, now who says you'll make time for it after this yeah. one year because what happens is okay let's 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 picture it right uh today is your first day of the year right and you've you've just mm. uh you've just finished your, your degree and you're going to take a year off for the masters and then you think to yourself well you know it's the first day let me just put my feet up a little and relax and finally i've got mm. a break of education and then that's and then what's to say that you're not going to just start getting a bit you know comfortable and a bit yeah. relaxed about it because you're not it depends on yourself are you going to treat it like boot camp or are you going to treat it like mm. a holiday where i read a few pages every now and again yeah you know yeah so it depends on on how she is and everyone listening can think about that as well uh what you're like you know you've got to be so real with yourself isn't it and just see what what is likely to happen that's why i like the idea of being in an environment where people are holding you accountable yeah of uh, course it's definitely good but imagine imagine Muhammad though you, she spends this year she's not even going to some intensive course or whatever she's just doing it by herself what if in that year she got some foundational knowledge of Islam some principles oh, yeah, that she can apply for the rest of her life yeah. then even if she doesn't continue the study it certainly would be uh, useful yeah all I'm saying is you know the vibe that I caught is that mm. it's an excuse but if it's not and if you're going to hold yourself, mm. even, you know what, just be serious about it. If this is a decision you're going to do, then be serious about it in the sense that, mm. you know, get yourself a teacher. Maybe there's someone at the masjid that's going to teach you and mm. make a timetable. And, you know, every, you know, this day, every week or however, however often I'm going to be tested. Yeah. You know, my wife's doing yeah. that now with her Tejweed stuff because she's not working. So mm. she's going full force as much as she can. Um, yeah, just absolutely. learning and, and not just learning at home but actually getting a teacher someone to teach her and this is the day that it's going to be done every week and this is when your yeah. test is and you know so that's that's the only way to do it you have to yeah. treat I it think in school. don't overestimate your willpower exactly never under never overestimate it especially when there's such a big uh, temptation of apathy and not doing anything because really and truthfully mm. you know your the way she spoke about education is i just want to get it over and done with you know, mm. but if, maybe, if you've maybe got a mentality, I, I paraphrased it wrong. Well, Allah alam. Okay, <laughs> maybe. But if if yeah. that is a mentality you have, of, I just want to get it over and done with. Then already yeah. you're you just want to break from education. 
you know mm. if you've got a mindset mm. of well this studying that I'm doing now is getting too much for me I want to break from education actually you know what while mm. I have this break let me memorize some Quran well no Quran mm. also re- requires you to have you know or well, Islamic knowledge also isn't a walk in the park it also requires you to have serious you know yeah it's not a break definitely yeah, yeah. If, yeah. You, if you're kind of serious about it it's true also you know I just thought of um, if you're going to take a year off and you don't know Arabic, then maybe, I don't know if you've got family in some uh, Arab country or if you can find someone to stay with in Arab country, spend yeah. like six to 12 months there, learn Arabic, that would change your life forever. That yeah. would be really good. So that's another option. But I think uh, there's a lot of different ideas we've given her, inshallah. Um, before we end, Muhammad, I just want to ask you, because I thought about this, you know, taxes, yeah? yeah. Everyone hates taxes. Yeah. But what about the idea that um, you could have the intention that you're paying taxes to give people, um, pay for schools and roads and, and, and hospitals and stuff? Uh, like that could be sadaqa, right? Uh, uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Isn't that what zakah is meant to be for? You know, in the uh, utopia we were talking about? That zakah uh, it goes to yeah, Beit al Mel, Beit al Mel, the money of the state, and then the state, this you know, the state has a, uh, you know, treasury, yeah, yeah. treasury, and you, every citizen has a right upon the state, or the other way around. The yeah, state. well, I'm talking about the UK, obviously. So the, the yeah. zakah is is not really distributed in that way. It's not used for that. No, stuff. of course. Um, but I think in the utopia, you know what? I th- I honestly think the way that the way that um, countries are run these days. It would be impossible to run a country with just 2.5% of people's uh, stored wealth. Yeah. I think it would be impossible. And in the past, uh, gov- uh, Muslim governments have taxed citizens when they need it. So for a specific reason, they'll be like, I don't know, we're building this or we need, we need an army to defend against this, this, yeah. this invader. Then they would specifically tax the people for that. I don't know if they had this whole percentage Although, thing. Okay, in well, contact. well, uh, oh. When it comes to that kind of defending and all that, there's verses in the Quran regarding, you know, you know, jahidu bi amwalikum wa anfusikum, etc. You know, so. Um, but does it not apply when you're when you're paying for hospitals, Yanni? I don't know. I think you're asking the wrong person. If you have that intention, Allah alam, you know, maybe maybe. Sh- so you never thought of this, and you wouldn't really consider it like sadaqah. Um, I don't know because I mean when I get taxed. It's like for every four pound I make, one pound gets taken away, and not not just painful. It's it's awful, you know, and it makes it hurts my heart. So I always feel like it's too much. But <laughs> I think a lot of people are like that. Yeah, I I, I agree. I mean, I, I've not I don't live in the UK, so it doesn't it's not the same. I don't get that thing. But at the same time, how are countries supposed to run? You know, I don't know. You're asking the wrong guy. This is too much for my taste. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I really don't know. Okay, Jazakallah khairan. Very good episode. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I don't even know if we hit all your bullet points. Did we? Or did we just go off on uh, one? <laughs> no, no. Um, one, two. Two bullet points are missing. Not, but minor, really. Alhamdulillah. I think it was good. I think it's good. I think. Alhamdulillah. Um, inshallah, the UAE don't, um, you know, get rid of you completely. I mean, what is it? <laughs> what is the story? So they basically taken away a lot of tools to make calls specifically yeah voice over ip is blocked well the skype wasn't blocked but just this week it started uh, playing up so i don't know what they're doing about that i but, ask your neighbor because i think it's yeah. just specifically you they're worried about <laughs> <laughs> i searched online and actually a lot of people complaining about it uh, subhanallah so, well when there's a will there's a way and we find a way and there'll always be a way inshallah yeah um and if you want yeah, to, uh, email us. yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. If you want to email us, then you can do at mindheistpodcast at gmail dot com. Uh, yeah, we we love reading your emails. And, yeah. um and share the uh, share the podcast, inshallah. Just like throw it on your Facebook and just say, um, you know, I've been listening to this. I've been getting into podcasts recently. This is a good one. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Whatever, whatever's going to appeal to to people. Yeah, there's, follow you. there's a lot of Muslims uh, starting up podcasts actually, and it's it's good to see yeah. really because. Yeah, um, everyone's sort of doing something different, and I like that. Uh, and it's mm. a good little outlet, especially when I mean, I think someone mentioned it before. You know, instead of listening to music, you can listen to my um, 
awful voice. Your lovely voice. Oh, look at that. Different perception. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what else? Oh, yeah. Leave us a review on iTunes. Um, um, and, yeah, for a lot of people that don't know, you can listen to this on uh, Stitcher, which I forget to keep sharing. But that's for, like, mm. Android users, etc. Um, what else? Follow I mean on Serum Masters. I wish push your Snapchat because... Yeah, a few people add me, you know, like really? every week. Really? I don't even people. use Snapchat anymore. I should probably get on there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can follow myself on Achi Tweet on the Twitters. And that is all for this episode. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.